My talk today is called Food, Fracking, and Why I Love Richard Nixon. <laughs> You'll see. So I got pegged as Mr. Local, and understandably. I shop regularly at the Union Square Market for my restaurants, Savoy and Back 40, over the last 20 years. And our menus have always championed local producers. We cared about not just taste, but the story beyond the plate, and thinking about what impact our food choices have on other people and the planet. But I'm not a locavore, OK? What I am is a pragmatist. I buy coffee, olive oil, chocolate, lemons from distant lands without an ounce of guilt. <laughs> In fact, pounds of pleasure. <laughs> so we've had to grapple with uh, the, 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 the larger issues at times. So organic raspberries from South America or heritage pork grown in uh, factory farms. And so it seemed that now the time had come to face one of the key ingredients in our restaurant, our fuel, natural gas. 30% of the natural gas in this country uh, currently comes from a uh, controversial technique called hydrofracking. When I started to learn about it, um, I came as sort of the, the eco-chef that you know me as, where I instinctively assumed and knew that uh, gas drilling in New York State was going to be in conflict with healthy, viable, small farms. But I'm also the pragmatist, remember. Chefs love firepower. <laughs> and that requires a lot of BTUs, a lot of gas. I've heated my restaurant for the last 20 years with heating oil, which invariably ran out or got clogged on the coldest Saturday night of the winter. And so I recently made the decision to switch to natural gas. So if I'm going to increase my use of natural gas and continue it, and millions of others like me are doing the same, we have to look at what the collateral damage is, what the, the effect on Con contaminated water, scarred landscape, and the effect on greenhouse gases is. So fracking, or natural gas. So it used to be just a straight vertical well going down, uh, tapping into sort of a, a, a lake of, of, of gas, and uh, siphoned up. But this new technique, since 2005, is far more complex. You drill down a mile and a half to shale deposits lying uh, below ancient river deltas deposited 300 million years ago, and then burrow across, and uh, under intense pressure, there's a cocktail of water, sand, carbon compounds um, that then uh, create micro fractures, that's the fracking part, uh, into the shale which releases the gas, comes back up the pipeline, and goes either to a power plant to produce electricity to run these lights, or to run the gas down to New York City to power up my stoves. <coughs> Sounds like magic, right? But I would suggest to you that this is magical thinking, to believe that this is economically viable and risk-free. So what are the problems? There are a lot of problems, and I'm only going to focus on the water-related problems today. So to begin with, it requires vast quantities of water. Of the 35,000 wells in operation today in this country, they require the water supply of a city of 2 million people annual. So then what happens? Well, 30% of the water goes down into the shale into the shale bed, never to return to the surface, never to be part of the water cycle again. Now, how can that make sense in drought states like North Dakota and Wyoming and Colorado, where cattle herds are at all-time lows and grain prices are high? It just doesn't make sense. And then in states like New York and Pennsylvania, 
What, what's the other part of the story? Well, 70% of the water comes back up is known as flowback. It's now radioactive and toxic and has to be held in containment pits, uh, a leaked one here. And the hope and the expectation, what the industry is telling us, is that it can then be permanently isolated from our groundwater. So it's going to be trucked from this containment pit in trucks taken to injection disposal wells and sent back down into the earth. Containment is a precarious uh, concept. We, we know it. We, uh, you just saw Steve show you the hog lagoons that leaked into the water supply and created huge fish kills. We remember the, the broken casings, the well casings of deep water horizon and the BP spill. And of course, we have 50 years of uh, nuclear energy where we were promised uh, cheap, unmeterable electric energy, and we're still trying to figure out what to, where to put the radioactive wastes. And we can't forget Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and Fukushima. Accidents happen. They just do. And so, in fact, this is three days ago. There was a, there was a fracking spill in Windsor, Colorado. This is from a, a Colorado newspaper. And so once the water is spilled, it enters the tissues of our plants in the tissues of the animals we eat and affects our food supply. When gas extraction begins, it's called a gas play, which for me sounds a little bit more like a poker game than science. Currently, there are gas plays in North Dakota, Wyoming, Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania. And while there's plenty of gas that's been found, with it has also come air pollution excessive levels of ozone, sick cattle, earthquakes from the injection wells, even flammable gas from in your water tap from uh, escaped methane, which to me sounds more like the 10 plagues of Egypt than it does the clean alternative to coal. And currently, Governor Cuomo of New York is considering legalizing a hydrofracking gas play here in New York State that lies in the Marcellus Shale under thousands of acres of prime farmland and the watershed for millions of New Yorkers, including every resident of New York City. Which brings me to Richard Nixon. <laughs> so I reviled him for Watergate, for uh, putting, held, holding himself above the Constitution and his dirty tricks. And then when he resigned in disgrace, got pardoned and never had to stand and answer for his crimes. And so in 1995, when a stamp was issued in his honor, I bought 50 stamps and 50 envelopes with a jailhouse scene behind him so that every time I licked a stamp, I could put Nixon behind me. <laughs> I, could, I could put Nixon behind bars. But Richard Nixon is also the president who mandated environmental impact studies, created the EPA, passed the Clean Water, Safe Water Drinking Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Environmental, uh, sorry, and the Endangered Species Act. Yeah. In 1969 to 1973, before he resigned. And in so doing, created the law of the land that all US citizens and all US businesses had to live by. So that if an Ohio coal power plant was, its effluent wasn't affecting Ohio, but was drifting into the Adirondacks of New York and creating acid rain destruction of those forests that those companies had to modify their behavior. So that's still in place, right? Great for hydrofracking. But no, hydrofracking is completely exempt from federal standards on private lands. Why? Because Dick Cheney 
it's inserted into the energy bill of 2005, an exemption for the industry. So who belongs behind bars now? <laughs> yeah. So not only that, but in fracking, the energy companies have claimed that, um, that, that the additives that they put into the wells are proprietary. And what are they? They're called, uh, uh, they don't have to answer, to, but they're carcinogens. It's formaldehyde and naphthalene and toluene and nitrotriloacetic acid. I mean, this reminds me of, of Michael Pollan's food rules that says, if you can't pronounce the ingredients on the label, maybe you shouldn't be eating it. And that's what we're putting in the water. So if we don't have regs on the water, then no standards can be set, and we can't even test because we don't know what's in them. And in fact, the regulations that are being currently uh, proposed in New York State would say that for containment pits under 300,000 gallons don't have to be regulated. Is that what we want irrigating your favorite uh, Finger Lakes winery? I don't think so. So write your legislator, write your governor, like I did here. <laughs> he's, he's not behind bars anymore. Uh, and insist that we have federal regulation of fracking and that all the additives are disclosed. And only that way can we begin to uh, set a standard in the nation for our health and, and this industry. Now, if we had that, would fracking go away? Well, I don't think so. But we would be proceeding more slowly, more carefully. There would be health assessments. And we'd be thinking about what this means for uh, our future and for the land itself. Hydrofracking may produce cheap energy for the next several decades. Uh, but it doesn't really answer the problem. We have to use less energy. We've used up 50% of the carbon fuels, fossil fuels, on the planet in the last 100 years. We're ripping through it at an incredible pace. And so we haven't begun to address the issue of, of conservation and reduction. And again, Dick Cheney said in 2002, conservation is a nice moral personal choice but has no place in a national energy policy. Well, that's wrong, and we have to prove that wrong by insisting that Obama's all of the above plan isn't just about a menu of energy choices, but that there are enticements for conservation. And we have to insist that the federal government invest in alternative energies and the infrastructure to supply it. And that will cost money. And my utility prices will be higher. But that is the real price of dinner. And I'll pass that price along to you. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be able to dine with the knowledge that we haven't added to the ruin of the planet. And we'll all be able to chant together, grill, baby, grill. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>